My name is Matt Clark. I'm the sales director uh, overseeing our sports vertical at Factorial, and I'll be moderating today's session around fan engagement. Why do I want to sit through a three-hour event? Joining us on this panel, we have Christian Parsons, who's the vice president brand experience for the LA Rams. We have Jay Riola, the SVP of strategy and innovation for the Orlando Magic. And we have Adam Brady, who's the director of publications and digital content for the Anaheim Ducks and the Honda Center. So the purpose of this conversation is to talk through the, what sometimes can be a long three hour event, how things are changing, the information that fans demand at the games, how those are changing, how the experience is continuing to evolve and how we're gonna utilize technology, marketing automation, text messaging, second screen experiences, all to enhance that. So Adam, I'm gonna kick it back to you because you did a really good job of, of answering this question the, the, the first time, um, which no one got to hear other than us, but we've all been asked this question before, why would I want to sit through a three hour event when I could sit at home, don't have to worry about climate, don't have to worry about traffic, don't have to worry about rude people. What's the still the appeal with attending these events live? And then Christian or Jay, if you want to dive into after that, how are things evolving on the tech side with, with live events? I mean, aside from just the atmosphere. Well, I'll repeat my joke since it, it, the audience missed it the first time, but when I was first invited to this and I saw why do I want to sit through a three hour event, my first thought was, I don't. Sounds awful. But then when I realized it had to do with our games, uh, that, that sounded like something I could talk about. But, um, you know, we tell people all the time, whether it's a, a fan of the game or someone who's only been to one game or no games, um, especially with hockey, um, which I'm representing today, there's nothing can compare to seeing it live. Um, it's a great sport. All around, it's great on TV, but actually being in the arena and seeing it live, the sounds of the game, um, the sound of so someone being uh, knocked into the boards, of hitting a one-timer, of the crowd going crazy over a goal, there, there's, there's nothing that can compare. And I know today we're going to talk about all the other things going on in a live event that make, um, that entertain fans, but, but from an atmosphere point of view, there's nothing that can compare. Um, and the story that I often tell is about four years ago, we had a playoff game where we were down three, nothing. The ducks were, were down three, nothing with three minutes to go. All hope seemed to be lost. We somehow scored three goals in the last three minutes, including the tying goal in the last minute crowd went so crazy to send it to overtime. Um, just being in the building. Um, and I was working, I wasn't in the stands, but like a lot of us, but my hands were literally shaking for like an hour straight all the way into the first overtime and halfway through the second overtime i think my hands could not stop shaking and i've been to my share of great movies and great theater shows and restaurants or whatever i've never experienced anything compared to that and so that's that's one way i will tell you that um you know our games aren't usually three hours unless they go to double overtime in the playoffs but um that uh that right there just that atmosphere being feeling like you're a part of something feeling like you could see history at any moment that to me is uh, number one of why uh, why our sport is, is so great in person. Adam, I come from the baseball world, so if it ended in yeah. three hours, that was really <laughs> That's right, that's right. <laughs> so Jay, Christian, kind of taking it from a little bit of a, of a different perspective. I mean, I agree with Adam, and we probably all do, that atmosphere is gonna be reason number one that's gonna separate home versus watching it live. But what else? changes like what are some of the things whether today whether it's things that your organizations are looking to into the future that fans just can't get from home christian you want to kick us off yeah absolutely i'll jump in here so i think the way that i think about this question is a little bit different um I think about it, uh, especially post covid or sorry as as we're coming out of covid i think uh the people that are worried about staying at home, saving money, worrying about traffic or rude people or all that kind of stuff, or will self-select out, right? The people that I'm targeting right now with, uh, sorry, that we're targeting at the Rams, we're trying to get 70,000 people a game into the stadium, right? So preseason, that's 700,000 people during, the, during the, the whole year. And there's like 10 to 15 million people in LA. That's a sl small, small, small slice of the population. So being able to self-select out is incredibly helpful for us, right? Because the people that will be in there and will spend their hard-earned money on there want to be there and they're excited for there. And, and NFL football 
uh, fandom is a little bit different than uh, than than basketball, a little bit different than than hockey. In that we have people who will show up at our stadium before our parking lots open at 8 a.m. and start tailgating, right? For 1 p.m. or 1 1:25 p.m. start. So that enthusiasm there, and that's very 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 exciting. I think to your point though. Um, when, when we look at it from a football lens, there's a, when we're on the West Coast, there's a ton of awesome games going on, right? And there's a ton of really, really interesting things happening in general. And one of our things that we're looking to do is get people in the stadium earlier, right? As early as, we'll, as, as we're allowed from, from SoFi's perspective and from the NFL's perspective uh, from that, right? Because the experience within SoFi isn't just, uh, it's not just a stadium that's built to watch or to have a great uh, concert, a great foot, uh, you know, a great football game, a great you know fight or experience, but it's also an entertainment venue. There's top-notch rest restaurants there. There's clubs. There's spaces where you can be with your family if you have a if if you uh, have a, have a younger family. And then of course the uh, large video board up in there um, is built and designed as an amazing amount of real estate to provide not only entertainment. Um, so on our game days. Um, entertainment in our pregame show and all of that kind of stuff, but also to connect you back to probably the best live, you know, viewing it as kind of like the best living room in the world with a 5 million pound television in front of it. <laughs> right. So just, you know, obviously what we're, what, what uh, the playground we have to play with is, is very, very fortunate. Right. But I think the, the couple things to take away are one, the people that are self-selecting in to spend their hard, hard-earned money want to be there. They want to be there and they want to have a good time. So it's about, for us, it's about reducing the friction for them being there and reducing the friction and any kind of avenue that might take them down something that's a little bit frustrating. Jay, anything you want to add on that? No, I, th I, th I think Christian touched on it well. You know, I think we're, we're all, ultimately going to get to the conversation about technology. And I think we all, as, as marketers and sports and kind of the arena and stadium business, we have to react to how technology is influencing people in their, their lives outside of sports, right? So people are accustomed to using technology to order food to be delivered to their house or to have kind of ride sharing or Airbnb. And I think, so uh, we have to respond to that and Christian touched on it well. When you come to an event, I agree with Adam. Like taking in a game live is totally different. The atmosphere is different, especially like a high stakes game where you have a full building and there's a lot on the line. There, there's nothing that compares to it. But then there's a lot of in between. And I think all of our buildings now are true like entertainment destination centers where there's restaurants, there's clubs, there's sponsored areas, um, there's technology all over the place. And so we have a lot to offer outside of the game itself. And I think that that's, that's really important. Um, and, you know, for some teams, it's more important than others. I also think that what, what we're witnessing with the magic and, and overall in sports is, as we try to sell, you know, season ticket memberships or partial plan memberships, there's a lot more appetite now than there ever has been before for kind of a differentiated experience game to game or occasionally throughout the year. And offering fans the opportunity to not, if they want to have the same experience every time because they love it, that's perfectly fine. But there's a lot of people who maybe want to sit in a different location or access a different club or they're, they're hosting a bigger group. And, you know, there, there are ways that I think we all are, as teams, enabling that through, you know, in our case, we give season ticket holders the ability to return seats for games that they're uninterested in coming to and create a digital currency that they can use to customize their experience for games they are coming to. So maybe they want to sit closer to the floor one game or, or book a reservation at one of our club level restaurants. And so I think offering that and, and not being kind of, you know, close minded to the fact that fans do want to experience um, a different experience when they come to our games is, is really important, while all of the other stuff is, is, is ultimately important as well. Love that. So let's dive into, it's been brought up multiple times by the three of you technology. So let's just, let's just pivot there. So what are some ways that you're each looking at technologies within your respective arenas and stadiums? I know the hot topic has been a lot of second screen experiences. Maybe it's diving into creative ways that your team is engaging with fans during events. 
Jay, you, you had just mentioned technology. Is there anything that you want to dive into specifically on that front? Well, I think I'm interested, you know, I'm happy to share a few points. I'm really interested to hear how other teams and other leagues are responding to this too. You know, in, in our case, our season last year, and Adam, I guess you were, you were in the same circumstances. Our season was cut short. Um, you know, we had 10 home games remaining. And then when it became clear that the NBA was going to restart in, at Disney in the bubble, we, we knew it was important for us to kind of take a step forward in what we could offer our fans in terms of digital engagement in ways that they could connect to the team, be informed um, it, that, that we had never done before. And so we re relaunched our mobile application. We introduced a brand new second screen experience. And we did so in a lot of ways, honestly, to just connect with fans and to try to fulfill some of the sponsor obligations that we had to put sponsors, brands, and activation programs in, in front of our fans. And I think what has come out of it are some really creative and hopefully persisting solutions that engage the fans in terms of like predictive gaming and live trivia and polls and, and things of that nature that can exist for fans watching the broadcast at home, but can also more deeply engage people in, in the building as well, right? So there's, there's ways that you can connect beyond just atmosphere. There's ways that you can like play a game and compete against people in other sections of the building or sitting next to you. And so my hope is that we can take some of the, you know, silver linings that we all had to react to from, from COVID and, and kind of make, make for a better experience going forward. I think um, along those lines, like this might be, this, this way of thinking might even saying this might be 10 years late, but the, the previous attitude of, of people like us of these people should not be on their phones. They should be watching the game is gone. Um, instead of taking that approach, it's let's lean into it and know everyone's in the stands has got a device, whether, whether they're 12 years old or they're, they're 75. Um, and let's lean into it and let's give them something on that device that can make this fan experience even better. Um, you know, from a technological standpoint, we can talk about mobile food ordering, we can talk about upgrading your seat, uh, we can talk about making a reservation in one of the club restaurants. Um, from a social media standpoint, which is where I lean um, with the Ducks, you know, we can give them something on our Twitter and our Instagram, uh, an angle of the goal they might not have seen during the game or a replay of the goal that even if they did see it, they want to watch it again or send it to their friend. Look at this unbelievable goal that that Ryan Gislap just scored and I, I was there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then the other thing, and then one that's newest to us um, that Jay just touched on is the second screen experience. Uh, this year we dove in um, with something we called the Flying V experience, um, which is related to the Mighty Ducks movies for the, for the uninitiated, but we worked with a company called XEO on this and um, it was very successful. And the reason we, we, we jumped into it at first is because we, um, we knew fans were watching the game on TV and we wanted to give them something um, else to do during the game to interact. Um, and then, you know, this is like live trivia. This is, uh, we, had, we had a live DJ, um, you know, entertaining people during the intermissions. Um, we, we had, you know, some games that they could play. There was like a virtual pub game that they could play. Um, and then the last five, because when our state um, changed the regulations, our last five home games, we had people in the arena and we kept it going. So it was on your device, but it was also on, on the big screen. You scanned it with a QR code um, to log into it. And it was really, really successful. And especially for our team, I think um, the company we work with, who works with a ton of teams, told us we set a record um, for a couple of games. We had an average viewing experience of an hour, which is, is incredible. Um, we were averaging around 40 minutes um, on other games as well. So that's just one of the ways that we've, you know, we've really, like I said, leaned into the technological side and, and given people something on their device that that's relates to the game and keeps them engaged. Cool. And then just to, just to add on to all, all, all of those things, I think the way that, that we think about it uh, from our side is just making sure that whatever we're doing, that we're making it easy and making it part of the journey, right? Making it easy, making it part of the journey. We'll give you an example right now. One of the things that you'll see uh, at SoFi Stadium uh, during Rams games 
is uh, a drive chart, which is like the world's simplest thing, but it's something where Corey Belfort, our creative director, and Sarah Schuler have been, have been working really, really hard on, and it's a live drive chart. So Jared Goff uh, throws a pass to Robert Woods for 12 yards, that goes up there. You know, um, Cam Akers runs for three, that goes up there. You know, and, and so you can, you can see the whole drive so that if you're being distracted by some of the wonderful entertainment experiences, you can still kind of like go back and see under, and understand as a casual fan what's happening in that drive. And whether that's applied to something like that, or even as Adam was saying, you know, earlier, um, some people might have been frustrated that people are on their phones, but realistically, everyone's on their phones right now, right? Okay. So how do you create whether high tech or low tech moments of that, where if somebody's coming in and they've spent a couple hundred bucks to be in your building, they want digital proof that they were there, right? They want to be able to brag on whatever media platform that they're on, that they were there. How do we create those moments? How do we uh, encourage people to, to, to post that, to amplify and be advocates for the experience for us? So I want to dive just a little bit further into the second screen experience. Christian, you had even made the comment before, good for the casual fan to jump in. Where do we feel like the second screen experience is today versus maybe where we want it to be? And I asked a question, just I'm thinking through two things, right? Like what fan are we trying to target on there? Is it the casual fan? Is it the fanatic? And I just think about, you know, I had a boys weekend uh, a couple weekends ago. We were talking through second screen experience and none of them knew really what that was. They're like, I'm just going on Twitter and I'm just like texting some of my boys on the side. So I'm just going to open it up there. And I don't know, Christian, if you want to dive into that because you had talked about the casual fan and maybe the fan segmentation piece. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a great point because it, depending on who your audience is, your competition is different. You know, if your audience is just like a fan trying to track the conversation and be with other fans, to your point, Matt, that's going to be your competition is Twitter. If you're, uh, if, if, you're, if you're trying to have like a casual conversation with friends, that's going to be on your iPhone chat or WhatsApp or Signal or something like that. You know, in the group chat, that's, that's your challenge. Even if you're diving into the analytics, there's different analytic trackers, whether they're from our own league apps that allow for, for in-depth an analytic areas. So I think I don't have a really good answer for that is, is, is the true answer, right? Um, and I think as we're all out here and all as we're all experimenting uh, with this, I think it's about finding that match between that fan base, that real desire and what we're able to, to provide. Because there's, from a second screen experience, there's absolute utility once you are in the building. Um, you know, ordering food, um, getting reservations to clubs, you know, getting your parking valet pulled up, whatever it is, absolute utility, you know, even checking how long lines are at the bathroom, super, super utility behind, behind that. But as soon as you get to the, I'm on my couch watching second screen utility, I think that's where it's a little bit different because the natural behavior is already going to pull me to Twitter or to my group chat or to the NHL or NFL or NBA app. Uh, app or tracking on 538.com, right? So it, it, it is a little bit of a challenge. And I don't know if anyone wants to dive into, we had a good, good question that just came through. Um, can anyone speak to the operation side when implementing some of these creative second screen experiences? I know with Wi-Fi coverage, that can be an issue, but how do those potential challenges fit into your operations plan? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I was going to touch on this too, when we talk about the future of, of, uh, of the fan experience, but the the enhanced Wi-Fi is going to be key because um, as or and uh, sorry, it already is key. Um, and I know a lot of arenas, including ours, have made strides towards that. And I think um, a lot of them could be a lot better. But when you're when you're really banking on the fact that you know we we know that everyone's going to be on their devices and and we want them using these devices and we want them want them um, doing things with high bandwidth, like playing games and um, watching video replays and everything else, the, the Wi-Fi, the, the Wi-Fi coverage is huge. And, um, you know, you'll have fans that will turn off their Wi-Fi because they're under the impression that the Wi-Fi in the arena stinks. Um, so it's, it's an expensive endeavor, certainly, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a very, very high priority for us. And, and, you know, obviously stadiums that are holding 70,000, that's a whole other story. We're, we're, we're 17 to 18 at best. So, um, so that's huge. I'm looking at the question here, the operations side. Um, if you're talking about, um, well, I guess we were just talking about the WACA, but from our operations side, the other, the other 
um, factor with these second screen experiences is having the staff is having the staff to run them. And, and it's a staff that probably was already doing something else on game days and now it's having to shift to this and not now are you hiring additional staff or just part time game day people so um, that's something to take into consideration too as you start adding these these elements um, for, for, for the, uh, the uh, on the uh, device side. And, and Matt to take it back to your question and kind of tie it to some of the conversation with Adam and Christian so I, I do think second screen experiences like what's going to be interesting with the um, scale at which sports betting is becoming more and more legalized is where it fits because it will be a crowd. It, so obviously digital engagement with sports is already a crowded space. It's There's all the different social medias that you can go to. There's the team app, there's the ESPN app, you know, there's the all these different apps that you can choose to follow games and, and um, throughout the course of the game. You know, it, in our case, we're, we're trying to find the right fit. And I think you, you bring up a good question. Is it for a casual fan? Is it for an avid fan? I think we've tried to split the difference a little bit in the way that we've activated ours. And so some of the competitions in ours are quarterly where we are realistic that you may not join the entire game, but there's also a full game competition around kind of who, who is the high score, who are the top five high scores for the game. So if you are an avid fan, who's going to join the entire game and maybe watch multiple games, there's an opportunity for you to win something, but there's also something for, you know, someone who's only able to tune in for the first quarter. And some of the questions that we ask don't take any basketball knowledge. Like who do you, who do you believe is the next player to score a point for the magic? Some of them may um, require a little bit more, you know, knowledge on the history of the, the club or something to that fact. So I think it, it's a very good question. And I think one that we're all going to have to continue to monitor because the landscape already is changing and, you know, sports betting, I think, and um, what we're all experiencing with viewership will continue to change it as well as we go forward. Yeah. And with the sports betting side, it's even more critical and crucial that that the connection is strong and the Wi-Fi is strong. It's one thing to try to watch a replay of a goal and it and it stutters and you're and you say bummer. It's another to uh, have to tell a fan you lost out on that 150 bucks because the Wi-Fi was too slow for you to get your bed in. So um, the 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 potential of the predictive gaming and the gambling side of it, especially if and when our state um, allows such a thing, is is really intriguing to teams. Um, but again, you've got to have the bandwidth and the Wi-Fi coverage to to uh, handle that. So real quick here in the last four minutes, I just want to talk about some other ways that you plan on or maybe you are currently communicating with your fans. I mean, at Factoro, we provide an all-in-one solution where it's emails, text messaging, mobile push notification, web push notification. I mean, we spent a lot of time talking through second screen ex experiences, but maybe 10 years ago, like you purchased your ticket, you got an email that said, hey, here's your ticket, you show up, you go home, and that was it. We all know that fans expect a little bit more. So how are you prioritizing other ways to communicate with your fans, specifically at that three hour event? Well, I mean, at the event, obviously, like other teams, we're using text messaging pretty frequently. And, and another thing that we're um, kind of excited about diving into more is the, is the um, geo fenced uh, notifications. And for our fan base, and this, is, this falls under me as well, we need more people using using our app. Um, there was a little trepidation about using the app, um, uh, I mean, being really specific, but it's an act, technically an NHL app, and the Ducks content is within the NHL app. And I think some fans were hesitant because of that. They wanted the Ducks app, and, and we have to educate them on using that app. But once we get people using that and have their settings correct as far as allowing location-based notifications, everything like that, there's a ton of potential um, with doing that in Arena. When they arrive, um, you can have something that if you tap this, it takes you to a hub that tells you what's going on tonight around the arena. Um, it takes you to, you know, maps of, of, of concession stands, mobile ordering, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you can do those location-based alerts um, on demand, um, if there's a hat trick, you could say 20% off all hats in the team store because we know you threw your hat on the ice, you know, that type of stuff. So there's a ton of potential there that, that I get excited about when it comes to these, these geofence alerts. In other words, only hitting people that are within the arena or actually within the, uh, the, the, gate, the gate around the arena. Christian, Jay, you both have a, a minute. Christian, if you want to. Oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> well, that wasn't your fault. I was just, we're just <laughs> <running>. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think uh, the bigger challenge that we're facing, right, sorry, that we're facing right now is we actually haven't had people in the building, right? So we don't know how the traffic flow is going to happen. We don't know who's going to have their Bluetooth on. We don't know how all of those geofencing rings are going to work. And what uh, the, the positive thing that we have is that we're 100%, because we're a new building, we're going to be 100% digital tickets, right? So everyone at least will have an app to get in the building. Um, but the rest of it is a little bit of a mystery as, as we learn to like turn on the, the adoption, right? Because I think to Adam's point, um, the best utility of, of, of this, of, of, the, of your phone and the app is when your Bluetooth on, your location services on, and you're uh, able to, to, to accept notifications. As soon as you turn any of those things off, we're kind of in a little bit of a challenge. Yeah, for sure. But I, but I do think what's really exciting, you know, with the caveat of what Christian said, is the ability for personalized marketing and telling someone they're on an they're on an attendance streak, or you know, do you want to enter an attendance challenge and and see if you can compete against your fellow members on who can come to more games? All of that is now possible, especially if they're subscribed to push notifications and they're engaging with you on some of these digital platforms. And so I think the possibilities there, Matt, to your point on like an omni-channel marketing solution, um, is really exciting. Well, Christian, Adam, Jay, thank you all so much. If anyone has any further questions or wants to follow up and talk through any of the omnichannel marketing solutions, feel free to, uh, to shoot me over uh, an email at mclark at factorial.com or check out the sponsorship showcase. But thank you all for attending. It was a great uh, networking event tonight. So if you have time to pop into that, we'd love to see you. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, Steve.